I'm Christopher Clark, Cambridge historian. I was born in Australia. For Europeans, that's practically the other end of the world. But the European continent and its incredible diversity always fascinated me. Even in the far off country where I grew up, I was always aware that so much of our world has its roots in Europe. And modern Europe is one of the greatest achievements in human history. I want to share the grand saga of this continent. And in the process, I hope to rediscover its wonders for myself. Europe is a restless continent, a continent that is constantly reinventing itself. It began to project its power into the world. The expansion of the European frontier was one of the most momentous events of all human history. The world became the theater for the playing out of European power struggles. But these encounters with other peoples and their cultures and commodities in turn had a transformative impact on Europe itself. The history of Europe's expansion is a narrative of entrepreneurial spirit, technology, curiosity and courage, but also of violence, suppression and exploitation. Geography has always shaped Europe's opportunities right from the very beginning. The continent is flanked to the north, the south and the west by seas and oceans. 68,000 kilometers of coast, three times more than the United States. Crossing the water was the only way to expand. For people desperate to escape overpopulation, poverty, war and hunger, there was no other option but to leave by sea. And that's still true today. Europeans have always been driven by a thirst for adventure, a lust for power, and not least by greed. And their geographical destiny ensured that they were excellent seafarers. The Vikings construct seaworthy ships and set sail. 1,200 years before our era, they flee the harsh and unforgiving climate of the European North, constantly seeking new targets for their raids. They're talented shipbuilders and navigators, but their brutal conquests soon make them one of the most feared peoples in Europe. It begins on a June night in the year 793 with a raid on the island monastery of Lindisfarne off the coast of northern England. The monks are peacefully going about their work when they notice the ships rapidly approaching the island. They sense disaster, the first Viking raid. The Vikings storm the monastery armed with swords and axes, slaughtering the terrified monks. It's a bloodbath. The raiders plunder the monastery of its gold, silver, gemstones, and anything else that looks valuable. They soon make a name for themselves all over Europe with their hit and run raids. People everywhere utter the prayer, O oh Lord, protect us from the wrath of the Northmen. But the Vikings push the boundaries of their territory further and further. Eventually, they become more than just the terrifying raiders from the far north. They evolve into a well-equipped, confident maritime power. They discover Iceland and Greenland, and they advance as far as Newfoundland, where they establish settlements. They were the first to land on the coast of North America 1,000 years ago, but it was in Europe that they really left their mark, and their legendary raids aren't the only thing they're remembered for. Many regions bear their name. Normandy in France is named after these Northmen. And here where I'm standing, on the shores of the Gulf of Finland, the Northmen were known as the Rus, or the Rowers. And that's why today, this part of Europe is called Russia. The Vikings certainly got around in Europe. They made themselves at home wherever they went. And these erstwhile terrorists from the North created what was essentially the continent's first economic union. Networks and interconnections of this kind enhanced the cohesion of Europe as a cultural space. Westminster Abbey in London, Mont Saint-Michel in northern France, and deep in the south of Italy, 
the Palazzo dei Normanni in Palermo. The Vikings also made their mark on the continent's architecture. The impressive Norman citadel known as the Castel del Monte, later used as a palace by the Hohenstaufen dynasty, is a case in point. European marketplaces become a lot more colorful thanks to the Vikings. They're able to offer a broader range of merchandise, including more exotic items. Traders return from long journeys with luxury goods. Initially intended for the nobility, these products soon begin to find a wider market. And spices from India are the best sellers of all. The Vikings pave the way, and German merchants soon follow in their footsteps, creating the Hanseatic League. Good business is always the goal. Trade missions spring up in the north and east. There are up to 300 flourishing Hanseatic cities. The trade in furs, pelts, wood, grain and beer is highly lucrative. The merchants grow immensely wealthy and their influence increases accordingly. Hanseatic shipping is now driving the European economy. German merchants open a trading post in the Flemish city of Bruges in 1235. The Venice of the north, Bruges is the hub of the Hanseatic League and will grow to become the wealthiest and most powerful Hanseatic city. The traveling merchants from Germany establish growing numbers of local trading posts in places like Bergen in Norway, where the fish trade is thriving. These entrepots provide the German traders with safe quarters in foreign countries. And by the high Middle Ages, the Hanseatic League is a brand worth protecting with a reputation for reliability and fair dealing. That's not to say that these early European traders didn't have a keen nose for business. They expanded their trade routes all the way to Russia. Even today, you can feel the spirit of the Hanseatic League in cities such as Tallinn in Estonia, formerly known as Reval. The Hanseatic League is an early form of the European Union. Trade routes are increasingly tight-knit and a new system of logistics is developing in Northern Europe. The League maintains ties outside of its member countries as well, including with the Republic of Venice, which becomes a vital hub. In fact, the flourishing trade and resulting prosperity allows the Venetians to expand their fleet. They dominate trade throughout the entire Mediterranean region with their hundreds of ships. The Venetians' share of influence extends from the east coast of the Adriatic Sea to Constantinople, Syria and Lebanon, and across the Black Sea all the way to Asia. But that's not enough for the Europeans. They want to go even further. Europeans become engrossed in speculations about the world beyond the world they know. They know that the Earth is round, but they have no idea of what lies beyond the horizon. Why did the Renaissance become an era of European world exploration? Was it intellectual curiosity? Or the competitive ambition of powerful states determined to deny each other the advantages of new possessions? The Spaniards and the Portuguese were the first, the Dutch, the British, and the French followed hard on their heels. Whatever drove them to make these perilous journeys, one thing is clear, the world would never be the same again. The race is on to find an ocean route to India. Genoese explorer Christopher Columbus is working on a plan. He offers it to the Portuguese, but they dismiss him as a madman. He carefully studies the Book of the Marvels of the World by Marco Polo, in which the Italian explorer details his adventurous journey to Asia. The book is a bestseller in Europe and feeds a desire to know unknown worlds. Perhaps Columbus can convince the Spanish to fund his plan. But that's no easy task. He spends more than five years begging Queen Isabella of Spain before she finally gives in. Columbus is entrusted with the task 
of finding gold. Why? Because the Spanish crown is bankrupt. Columbus set sail in the summer of 1492. His crew consists of ruffians, murderers, and thieves who have nothing to lose, not what you might call a seaworthy team. He's unable to attract better men. The fear of the end of the world is simply too powerful. Columbus grossly underestimates the size of the globe. He thinks he's on his way to India. The Atlantic Ocean seems endless, but then finally, land home. After more than two months of uncertainty, it seems that the sailors' prayers have been answered. The team of three ships has been on the verge of mutiny more than once, but finally, the sailors fish some reeds and a few twigs with berries on them out of the sea, harbingers of land. The sailors are fascinated with the flora and fauna on this unfamiliar shore. Christopher Columbus writes in his journal, Upon disembarking, we saw a landscape with very green trees, many streams of water, and diverse sorts of fruits. Columbus is itching to seize this land. He has enough witnesses, and his crew even includes a notary to certify the entire process. Of course, the question that has them all on the edge of their seats is whether or not the land is inhabited. After all, part of their mission is to find the natives and convert them to Christianity. When they do eventually meet the locals, both sides are curious. Columbus would later report, I was very attentive to them and strove to learn if they had any gold. And he succeeded in the name of God and the Spanish crown. The native peoples, on the other hand, are baffled. They had never seen white men before. Things would ultimately end badly for them, but the first encounters remain peaceful. While the natives innocently marvel at the new arrivals, Columbus and his men already have very clear goals in mind. Two worlds collide here, the islanders have no concept of ownership. They believe the land belongs to everyone. The Europeans, on the other hand, want to annex territory, convert people to Christianity, and exploit both the land and its inhabitants. This is where the fatal race for resources begins. <laughs> Columbus calls the natives Indians. He is thoroughly convinced that he is in India. He finds the people to be friendly and not at all dangerous. He believes they would make excellent slaves. But he has actually landed on the Bahamas in the Caribbean. And although he doesn't find any gold, he is standing on the threshold of an unknown continent. The Baheim Erdapfel, the oldest globe still in existence today, was created in the very year Columbus sailed to the west. All the geographical information Europeans were aware of at that time is included on this globe, but its precision naturally varies from continent to continent. The Atlantic extends all the way from Europe to Asia. Both continents are a bit too big, and there's nothing in between them. Or is there something? A terra incognita. But why did all of this originate from Europe and not from what was then an already powerful and technologically advanced China? When the third emperor of the Ming Dynasty ascended the throne in 1402, he sent out a gigantic fleet to sail to Africa and Arabia. But when he died, the new emperor received a memorandum from his advisors. They wrote, your servants hope that your majesty will not permit warlike plans and the gaining of glory by expeditions to distant lands. Give your people a period of rest. Whereupon the new emperor promptly decreed that high seas navigation would henceforth be punishable by death. The Chinese leadership simply had little interest in the outside world. China sufficed unto itself. Moreover, they had only one ruler. Power was focused in one place. 
there was no competition, not at least in the world of power politics. In Europe, almost as big as China, everything was different. It was shared among many sovereign territories with just as many rulers, and they kept goading each other on, even as they set their sights beyond the margins of the continent. Discoveries and conquests became weapons in a continental power struggle. To prevail in this struggle, you had to be open to new ideas and always ready for the big move. Hordes of armed men follow Columbus to the New World. They have nothing to lose in Spain, and they hope to find a better future across the ocean. They board ships heading west, and along with their horses, they advance deep into Central America. This land must harbor incredible treasures, they think. Legends like El Dorado, a Central American ruler so rich that he supposedly covers himself in gold dust every morning and washes it off every evening in a sacred lake, only serve to increase their thirst for adventure. But where is El Dorado, and where are his piles of gold and silver? The conquest of the New World offers immense opportunities to the restless, underemployed men of the Iberian Peninsula. As conquistadores, they strike deep inroads into the Americas, driven by greed, missionary zeal, and the desire for status. The main competitors of the Spanish are the Portuguese, an experienced seafaring nation. They too have an insatiable desire to explore the world in search of opportunities that will give them an advantage over their rivals. Five years after the discovery of America, explorers Vasco da Gama and Bartolomeu Diaz set off for India. They round the dreaded Cape of Good Hope at the southern tip of Africa and become the first Europeans to actually make it to India via this route. There's an astonishing dynamism to this process of European expansion. Competition with the Spanish crown drives the Portuguese to keep extending the range of their operations. And the extraordinary success of this small European country suggests that they must be doing something right. It was with these ships, caravels, that the Portuguese first reached Africa, India, Brazil, and Japan. Without such craft and their later and larger follow-up versions, the Europeans wouldn't have discovered anything, let alone conquered it. And what lay behind them was nothing less than cutting-edge technology. The caravel was the space shuttle of its era. Very fast, extremely stable, storm-resistant, and able to navigate in shallow coastal waters. Incidentally, there are virtually no written records of how this breakthrough invention was achieved. It was all kept secret. The shipbuilders passed their knowledge from generation to generation by word of mouth. After all, the competition was always watching. European audiences are enthralled by the explorers' travel journals and by the stories of their adventures which describe breathtaking landscapes with lavish natural wonders around every corner. A life of prosperity and abundance seems possible there. The natives must surely be doing well for themselves if they can afford the kind of spices only possessed by the wealthiest Europeans. In the race for conquest outside of Europe, Spain and Portugal remain bitter competitors. Now the Pope plans to step in to arbitrate the conflict. In 1494, a treaty is negotiated in Spain to regulate each country's holdings. Using a simple method, the world is divided into two halves. You servant, take this cord and stretch it across the map. Right down the middle. Like this. That's how we'll divide the world. No, that won't do. You, move more to the right. Further, further, and you, the other. Further to the left. Good. That's how the border should be. Here is my part, and- No! 
No way! The Treaty of Tordesillas is intended to establish a definitive peace between the two rivals. America, to the west of this randomly fixed line, is promised to the Spanish kings, while all the territory to the east, meaning Africa and Asia, goes to the Portuguese. The treaty doesn't even consider the other maritime powers, such as England and Holland. The conflict over global wealth now begins in earnest, and the competition among the European powers grows even fiercer. Everything changed. Europe's view of the world, its prosperity, its greed for more and more. The violence of this conflicted continent was projected outwards onto other peoples with horrific consequences. The explorers were followed by the conquerors. They set out into a strange and unfamiliar world, lured by legendary treasures and adventure. Mexico is a good example. Hernán Cortés brings an army with him right from the start. The conquerors view this new territory as their property, as though no one lives here. But of course, there are already people and cultures inhabiting these territories. This is Europe's original sin. By the time the Europeans arrive, Mexico is the center of a highly advanced civilization, but the conquerors are unimpressed. Their goal is to strip the country's assets and Christianize the population. We used to admire these fearless adventurers. We had forgotten what misery they inflicted on so much of humanity. Gold is abundantly available on this continent. It's a highly visible feature of indigenous culture, and the Mexicans who use and display it have no idea of the lust this treasure excites in the European invaders. The war against the native peoples begins. It's arrows versus firearms. Entire peoples are enslaved, killed off, or perish from disease and malnutrition. Their culture is destroyed, their treasures are cut off to Europe. What's more, the Europeans pit the continent's various ethnic groups against each other. The Aztec temple in modern-day Mexico City is leveled. On its foundations, the Spaniards construct a Christian cathedral. Europeans destroy a powerful empire and build their own on its ruins. It was a potent mix. In South America, Western European imperialism blended with religious zeal, and so the new lords set the stamp of their authority on the lands and people they captured. Many of the cities on the conquered continent still bear the signs of it today. Their models were palatial monasteries, such as the Mushteiro do Hieronymus, or Hieronymus Monastery in Lisbon. Imagine the effect of such prideful, elaborately decorated facades on the indigenous peoples. The Europeans profit not only from the continent's gold and silver, but also from the natives' agricultural and medical knowledge. In today's globalized world, it's virtually impossible to imagine how deep the impact of these encounters was. There's profound change on both sides of the Atlantic. Foods that had never been seen in Europe before revolutionized the European diet. Corn, tobacco, cotton, potatoes, coffee, and chocolate made their way into Europeans' shopping baskets. After the introduction of the South American potato, Europeans finally have enough to eat. Soon the population explodes. You might even say that the American potato helped to lay the foundation for Europe's rise as a global power. It fed the masses. And in return, America gets grain crops, cabbage, wine grapes, and most importantly, domesticated European animals. The settlers now arriving in America bring pigs, cows, and horses. Life completely changes within just a few generations. The surviving native peoples gradually establish permanent settlements and acquire private property, just like the Europeans. America's prairies become agrarian landscapes a decisive turning point in the continent's ecology.
but even a peaceful encounter can have terrible consequences. The conquerors bring more than just their religious faith to the new world, they also bring pathogens that spell doom for many native peoples. Historical records suggest that within a short time as many as 80% of the native population died of smallpox, plague, typhoid fever and influenza. We can trace the story of this dark chapter, the colonial era, at the Sugar and Slavery Museum in London. I've come here to find out more. We're in the Docklands in the heart of London, and in the 18th century, this was where they traded in sugar. It's often demonized today, but in the 18th century, it was idolized. Sugar was at the center of European dreams of power and wealth. The desire for sweetness is deeply embedded in the genetic makeup of human beings. The demand for colonial sugar was insatiable. In the years between 1770 and 1775, sugar consumption in England rose eightfold. No other commodity, not even gold and silver, could match it for importance. No other commodity so drastically exemplifies the destructive impact of European consumption. And no other product is so closely intertwined with the exploitation of Central and South America and the degradation of the human beings who live there. But exactly how did this system of exploitation operate? The Caribbean became the object of intense competition among the European colonial powers. Alongside Spain, France, the Netherlands and England also became increasingly hungry for goods from the Caribbean. In the process, human beings themselves were degraded to the status of commodities. The more colonies the Europeans acquired, the more workers they needed. Networks of African traders provided the Europeans with slaves. These were shipped to North America and the Caribbean to be exploited on sugar plantations. Ships transported the products of the slave system to an insatiable England. And the next slave raid in Africa followed soon after. This triangular trade became the most lucrative branch of maritime commerce until, in 1807, a law put an end to the slave trade in England. The Europeans' contempt for the black population is a decisive factor here. They're treated as goods, not as people with rights, and the slave trade is shockingly lucrative. In collusion with tribal chiefs and Arab slave traders, the Europeans capture the natives and transport them to harbor towns where they're shipped to the colonies in slave galleys in abhorrent conditions. The atrocity of slavery would make Europe rich and powerful. This continent's ascendancy was secured at an immense cost in human suffering. There are registers in which the slaves were listed as if they were cattle. On this list here we see on the left hand side the names of each of the slaves, then their ages, here the price that was paid for them, and on the right hand, remarks on each individual, uh, that he is sickly, that he is a good Negro, a good hand, that he is a runaway, that he is slightly consumptive. Human beings are treated as commodities. There are approximately 40,000 slave transports from Africa to America. 12 million people are shipped on slave galleys, but only around 10 million of them are still alive when they arrive. They are processed through the slave markets and spend the rest of their lives on sugar plantations, cotton fields, or in the mines of South America. The goods produced in the New World are then sent back to Europe, a profitable cycle for white Europeans. Spain and Portugal proudly show off their new wealth. Cities like Seville and Lisbon grow into radiant, bustling metropolises, sparking envy among their neighbours. Europe is dominated by relentless competition for profit and power. 
other countries shoulder their way into the global marketplace. The Dutch are particularly active here as merchants and as pirates. With its powerful fleet and modern financial system, this tiny republic keeps its European neighbors on edge. The merchants' impressive homes still bear witness to that golden era in the Netherlands' history. The Amsterdam Stock Exchange is established in the early 17th century. It's a meeting spot for people who want to invest their money in securities, as well as for those who hope to turn their securities into money. In that sense, this stock market is an early form of exchange or trading floor. And, like today's stock markets, this one had its bubbles and busts. This was the era of the tulip craze. These beautiful flowers had become a valuable commodity hotly traded on the stock exchange, even while the tulip bulbs were still in the ground. In the winter of 1636, the tulip bubble burst. 99 bulbs were auctioned off for 90,000 guilders, about 900,000 euros in today's money. The buyers were speculating that prices would continue to rise and they would be able to resell the bulbs at a profit. But it was not to be. People suddenly lost interest in the overpriced flowers and the speculators were left high and dry. The wealthy merchants invest in art and the revenues from trade fuel the rise of the Dutch school, whose artists Rembrandt Vermeer and Franz Hals still adorn the museums, reminding us of the opulence and sophistication of the Dutch Golden Age. Without the profits from the slave trade, none of this would be here. For the Spanish and the Portuguese, converting the heathen to Christianity was still an important part of the motivational mix. But in the 17th century, Protestants, especially in the Netherlands, were quite literally at the helm. As seafarers and cartographers, they had plenty of experience. And now they founded the world's first multinational concerns, corporations with a global remit, like the Dutch East India Company. By this means, they secured a monopoly on trade with Asia. At times, they had nearly 5,000 ships under sail. Hardly surprising, then, that the merchants of Amsterdam, as depicted by Rembrandt, became immensely wealthy and built these wonderful palaces. No one can deny that this European city has a harmonious beauty about it. But there's a dark side. The lion's share of this wealth was acquired through the exploitation of peoples and of the colonies where they lived. It's an unsettling legacy that's still with us today. The odd pediment above a front door in Amsterdam still tells the tale. Here, for example, this house belonged to the famous Admiral Cornelis Tromp. He was a 17th century seafaring hero and master of many slaves here in Amsterdam. And here's a little black boy that the Admiral bought for perhaps a few guilders. The sense of a God-given superiority over other humans is breathtaking. And Europeans have not found it easy to look this part of their history in the eye. It was only a few years ago that the Dutch Queen officially acknowledged the suffering inflicted on 550,000 slaves in the name of the Crown. And this dark past is still alive in the present, even on the royal carriage. But in a Europe that prided itself on its civilization and Christian values, were no dissenting voices raised against this appalling injustice? Well, yes, there were. And one of these voices belonged to Bishop Bartolomé de las Casas, who in the 16th century took up the cause of the enslaved native Indians, though he only later acknowledged the rights of African slaves. It was always unjust to catch them, and it was tyranny to enslave them, he wrote. This was probably the first European commitment to universal human rights. But it was not enforced until 200 years later, and then only temporarily. England would soon overtake the Netherlands as the leading colonial power. London became the foremost hub and driver of globalization.
Rule Britannia, Britannia rule the waves. It's a fantastically catchy song that still stirs the blood of patriots here in England. The ascendancy of modern Britain began with the victory over the Spanish Armada 450 years ago. With a modern naval fleet, Britain did indeed soon rule the waves, bankrolled by the raids led by legendary privateers like Sir Francis Drake. Elizabeth I was the self-confident queen who led her country out of the shadow of Spain and Portugal, allowing it to become a global player. In a famous portrait of the queen, we see the victorious fleet and the sinking armada, Elizabeth I as a goddess of war. And here in Westminster Abbey, she rests in peace, the Virgin Queen who devoted herself entirely to her country and opened the world to England. Over the centuries, Britain proves its mettle as a naval and colonial power. By 1913, the British Empire encompasses about a quarter of the world's population and about a quarter of its total land area. The British navigator, Captain James Cook, is in the Pacific to observe the transit of Venus, but he has an additional secret task, to search for new territories in the South Seas. There is already abundant evidence of another southern continent, Terra Australis Incognita, my home country. On the 29th of April, 1770, James Cook drops anchor off the coast of Australia. He had set sail from England towards the South Pacific a year earlier. Now Cook will be the first Englishman to set foot on Australian soil, a triumph for the ambitious explorer. He goes ashore at a place he will dub Botany Bay because the botanists who travel with him collect hundreds of plants here that no one in Europe has ever seen before. Cook claims the east coast of the country for the British Empire and names the region New South Wales. But the country Cook has discovered for England is not uninhabited. The Aborigines arrive on the continent more than 60,000 years before Cook. According to their mythology, they've been entrusted with the land by a higher power. They populate the country as hunters and gatherers. And now come the Europeans who seize the land and murder many of their people. There are many places in Australia where you can find the petroglyphs of the Aborigines. Some of this artwork is up to 20,000 years old. It's the spiritual architecture of the continent. The images communicate reflections on the natural environment, but there are also depictions of humans. The white invaders adopt a threatening, demanding attitude, and their weapons are painted blood red. But something else begins with Cook's arrival too, systematic research into the continent's flora and fauna. The sailors who undertook these epic journeys were always joined by a complement of scientists, astronomers, botanists, experimental gentlemen as they were known here on the endeavor. In the 18th century European world empires, Science and power entered into an intimate relationship, gathering knowledge about the world, extending it, structuring it, was essential to the wielding of imperial power. The Endeavour was a British ship and its captain was a Yorkshireman from Whitby, but not everybody serving on this crew was British. The experimental gentlemen, the experts and scientists who joined this team for the journey of exploration to New Zealand and Australia included the Finnish botanist, Hermann Spuring, and his Swedish colleague, Daniel Zolander. And on a later journey with Cook, the great German natural scientist, Georg Forster, joined the crew. These journeys of discovery were a genuinely European phenomenon. At this point, no one is planning to colonize the country. It's not until 18 years later that the first British fleet lands with a very different purpose. Initially, Australia serves as a penitentiary for convicted criminals from England, 
enormous prison colonies like Port Arthur on Tasmania are the result. It's believed to have been the worst jail in the entire British Empire. More than 12,000 prisoners endure hell on earth in this remote location. By the 19th century, the English have spread out to every corner of the world, America, Asia, India, Oceania, Australia. English is becoming the new global language alongside Spanish. But the British soon run into trouble with their increasingly wealthy and self-confident white settler colonies. In 1773, the conflict between the British motherland and the American colonists escalates in Boston. Thirteen colonies revolt, and their revolution eventually creates the United States of America. British subjects become American patriots, and the cause of the frustration in Boston is the exorbitant tax on British Indian tea. The furious Bostonians board the British ships and dump an entire shipment of tea into the harbor. It's the first step towards American independence. Even today, there are still regular reenactments of this event in Boston. What begins as a tax riot soon expands into a movement for independence. The motto of the British colonies in America is give me liberty or give me death. The Revolutionary War begins in 1775. Englishmen, Germans and Frenchmen, supported by their respective indigenous allies, are engaged in the struggle for the future of a continent. Ultimately, the colonists win their freedom from their colonial rulers with a decisive victory at the Battle of Yorktown. The Declaration of Independence is followed by the adoption of the American Constitution. But like many constitutions, this one is not an entirely faithful mirror of reality. Notwithstanding the colony's dependence on slavery, it solemnly states that all men are created equal. For all these dissonances, the American Constitution was an important step towards the emergence of modern democracy, not just in America, but in the old world as well. Where there is liberty, there is my country. In the decades that followed, millions of emigrants would take this motto to heart and pack their bags. They leave Europe behind them. Whole villages emigrate together. They are fleeing poverty and hunger in search of a better life. Today we might call them economic refugees. They view America as the land of prosperity and self-determination. No other continent has exported as many people as Europe, even into the 20th century. Today, nearly 50 million Americans claim that they have German ancestors, and many others have French, British, Irish, Spanish, or Italian roots. In the 20th century, America becomes a safe haven for Europeans seeking a better life. It's impossible to imagine modern America without them. In the 19th century, the United Kingdom is the largest colonial power in history. But the other powers don't want to be left empty-handed, and there's still some land to be had. for the spoils of imperial conquest. In the 19th century, the European colonial powers entered into a bitter competition, the scramble for Africa. Colonialism was a fetish, 
It had less to do with profits than with prestige and fantasies of power. To possess and develop colonies was considered a sign of modernity. And here too, everything revolved around competition, that crucial motor of European history, which in this form existed on no other continent. The British were at the height of their international power, and they forced their neighbors to the margins of world events. This fullness of power was personified in Queen Victoria, who was also Empress of India, and once said, we are not interested in the possibilities of defeat. They do not exist. The British were now stronger than they ever would be again. But like all great powers, they were surrounded by rivals and enemies. They were not the only players contending for African prizes. France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal, all of them wanted a piece of the great pie, a piece of Africa. The great powers meet in Berlin. A continent is divided up and portioned out. It's the Berlin-West Africa Conference of 1884. The German Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, has invited representatives to the capital of the German Empire in an effort to prevent a looming conflict between the African colonial powers. 14 countries are competing for the last remaining territories. Ultimately, it's the Belgian king who emerges as the big winner. He's promised the entire Congo Basin, rich in resources. 10 million people will later pay for this decision with their lives. Germany, too, joins the ranks of the colonial powers. The Europeans know little of Africa. They think of it as the dark continent. Africa has already been bled dry by the slave trade, and now the last unconquered territory, except for Ethiopia and Liberia, is divided up among the European powers. Arbitrary borders, systematic exploitation. Today's Africa is still grappling with the consequences. In many parts of Africa, the indigenous populations resist the colonial authorities. At the Battle of Waterberg in what is today known as Namibia, the Germans, led by the infamous Lothar von Torta, drive the Herero people into the desert. Torta calls it a race war. It becomes an exercise in mass extermination. In Africa, colonial authority is founded on an alliance between the gun, and the Bible. Missionaries educate the native populations and convert them to Christianity. The Europeans propagate their own civilization, deeply convinced of its superiority. At the beginning of the 20th century, the arm of the European colonial powers reaches across nearly half the world. The Germans share islands like New Guinea with the Dutch, and Indochina, like wide swathes of Africa, is under French control. The European powers even view China as a sort of colony. They gain colonial footholds all along the Chinese coast. Hong Kong, Macau, Tsingtao. In 1876, Great Britain's Queen Victoria is proclaimed Empress of India. Her immense Indian territories home to numerous ancient cultures, come to be seen as the crown jewel of the British Empire. No other continent had or would ever dominate such a huge portion of the world's peoples. We're still puzzling over the consequences. After the end of the Second World War, the European powers reluctantly give up their colonies. Europe withdraws to its heartland. But the legacy of European expansion casts a dark shadow. The two faces of Europe remain. Europeans discovered the world and the far side of the oceans for themselves, and they made their own kind of sense of the people and things they found there. From their perspective, it was a remarkable expansion of the horizons of knowledge, an extraordinary feat. On the other hand, 
The legacies of their conquests were scandalous. European civilization is the only one to have imposed itself on the rest of the world. And only very late in the day, after World War II, did Europe discover that it did have a conscience. So the history of Europe is made of contradictions. At the very moment when Pizarro and his conquistadors are exterminating the Inca, erasing their culture, and preparing to strip the Andes of their bullion, Michelangelo begins work on his fantastic painting, The Last Judgment, for the Sistine Chapel. The history of Europe has left deep scars as well as treasures. <laughs>